Uh, how many of you like getting gifts? Anybody? Anybody not like getting gifts? That might be, no, nobody. Nobody does. Everybody loves gifts. There's that anticipation about getting a gift, isn't it? You, you, get this, you get this package that's wrapped or you get this bag and, and you can't wait to just rip it apart or pull it out or, or whatever and there's an anticipation of what's behind that gift. We had one party after another, after another, after another this week. There was something going on. We turned our game night kind of into a little bit of a Christmas party and then the, the teenagers had kind of their own little deal and then we had another party on Friday night um, with uh, Jennifer works at Life Church down in Smyrna, which is a huge supporter of us. She works there a couple days a week, and we went to their staff Christmas party, and, and there's just been parties everywhere. And a couple of those, we've played white elephant games. Isn't that great? You know, and nobody did any crazy gifts this year. I was a little bit disappointed. There was no crazy gifts. I remember one year for a white elephant gift, I've shared this a couple times, that I got a Starbucks gift card that was underneath the bottom of a jar of Vaseline. You had to actually dig down into the Vaseline to get the Starbucks card out. At Brainy Bites, where um, I used to work with Jennifer, and and it was teaching, Uh, we'd have the staff Christmas party, and there was a package of uh, gravy, that that prepackaged gravy, the powder stuff that got passed around for about eight Christmases in a row. Crazy gifts. But there's something about that unwrapping, even if you don't get a gift that you want, because in that white elephant gifts, you get this gift and you think, man, this is awesome. And how many of you know that's not the gift you're going home with? I think this actually was a white elephant gift at one time. I think, yeah, I think it was. Actually, it's not even mine. A church that we were at several years ago, one of the guys was there. It was a gift at a party. And then he said, I'm going to keep it at your house so that I have a cup to drink out of when I come over. So it's been at my house ever since. And, and so Chris Wallace, if you happen to be watching this, thank you, I'm drinking out of your cup. Um, we love gifts. So the first week of Christmas that we spoke on, we talked about the Christmas present. The present that God gave us, which was Jesus. Not, you know, presents, He gave us His presence. You get to play on words there. I know that's kind of hard unless you have the visual, but... We have the presence of Christ through Christmas. He came to earth. God came down, became man in human form so that we could have His presence with us every day of our lives. So that was the first thing. Last week, I started basically two weeks of what I called the Christmas gifts, which were the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. Uh, And remember, last week I told you, how many wise men are there? Anybody remember? Yeah, we don't know. So 21 could be a good guess. It could be, we traditionally do three. We traditionally do three, but uh, because of what? The gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But we don't know how many wise men there were. It could have been a dozen, it could have been two, it could have been one, it could have, well, it could have been more, it had to be more than one, so there was wise men. So we don't know how many. That's kind of the point. Um, but there was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this is out of Matthew 2, and it should be in your notes today. I'm just going to kind of read where that came from. It says, When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those were the gifts that wise men brought to Jesus. And if you remember, I talked about this last week a little bit. Um, some of you that are on church for a while probably have heard this, but Jesus was probably about 18 months to two years old at the time. He, this was not in the manger in Bethlehem by the time they got there. This, they traveled from far away. We don't know exactly how long it took them to get there. There's, this is the best estimate that scholars have, is that it's somewhere you know, around 18 months to two years old. So he was a toddler. How many of you raised children, had toddlers, and are amazed that they survived being a toddler? I shared stories last week of Micah going through the window and his feet is dangling while his head's on the deck below and all you could see is feet. So I am amazed that my children made it through their twos, threes, fours. Now they're teenagers. I'm amazed in a whole different level. So... That's how old Jesus was. And, and, and 
Isn't gold, frankincense, and myrrh kind of an odd gift? If you think about it, how many of you with your two-year-olds, well, the gold, I mean, gold's a given. We talked about that last week. Everybody can use gold. We don't know what they did with the gold. We don't know if they put it in a little trust fund waiting for Jesus to, you know, get old enough to go out on his own. We don't know what happened with it, but we know they were given gold. We don't know how much. Uh, we just know he was given gold. Frankincense, we talked about that last week. Frankincense was kind of like the, the Swiss army knife of oils. It could do a lot of things. It was used for stomachs. It was used for antiseptic, all kinds of things that frankincense was used for. So that's kind of a practical gift. We're going to get into myrrh in just a minute. But we also talked about how these gifts were also prophetic. These were gifts that were given to a king. Jesus was this lowly child born into a carpenter's home in a small town. This wasn't a king in the sense of what we would think of born in a royal line. These were not normal gifts. These were gifts for royalty. And they were gifts that were prophesied that would happen, and, and they, they prophesied about who Jesus was. So last week, just to give you a recap, we talked about gold. We talked about its practical uses, obviously. Anybody have all the money they need? Okay, because I was going to talk to you afterwards if you did. We were going to you know, make a deal. Um, we could always use more money, um, most of us. Now, God takes care of our needs, but there's always a need for money. But gold also represented his kingship. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. If you look back, and we talked about in Revelation, that's what will be written on him, king of kings and lord of lords. There is no one throughout the universe that is higher than him. It was prophesied that he would sit on the throne of David, that he would come from the line of David. He is the great king. And to him, every knee will bow. So that's kind of what the gold represents. It was prophetic of who he is. Then you have the frankincense, which I already kind of talked about, that, that MacGyver of things. And it, 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 I can say MacGyver again because, you know, they redid the show. I would have dated myself a little bit, but I loved MacGyver when I was a kid. It was like MacGyver could do anything with gum, a paper clip, duct tape. I mean, he could fix a car. He could go into space. He could snorkel. I don't know. He could do everything with that. But frankincense represented Jesus as our high priest. And if you've ever studied the book of Hebrews and, and spent time there, it talks about who the high priest is and how Jesus fills that and what that role is. And basically what we talked about last week is the high priest is our representative before God. Almost like an attorney in a way. He was the one that kind of shielded us with God. And what Jesus did for us as our high priest, the high priest in the Old Testament would offer that yearly sacrifice for the sins uh, of the Jews. They would come together and they would offer the sacrifice. We talked about the scapegoat and all that, but they would sacrifice this innocent lamb for all of Israel. It was a temporary debt that was paid. It was a temporary payment for the debt that was owed because of our sin. Where Jesus came in and laid down his life and became that sacrifice. And so he took our sin upon himself and gave us his righteousness. It's kind of like if you pictured somebody having shabby, terrible clothes, somebody coming up and being well-dressed and looking good and kind of swapping the clothing and said, hey, look, take what I have. My righteousness is yours. That's what Jesus did for us as our high priest. It's pretty cool, right? It's pretty cool that we can stand before God and know that God sees us through the righteousness of Jesus and not through our own deeds and hearts, and hearts because we're sinful people. How many of you want to stand before God and have Him shout out every sin you've ever done? Anybody? You ever have that picture and you think about the, the judgment and like, you know, as we get more into technology, like there's this big jumbotron up there and it's your turn to stand up before God and he like plays every detail of your life. And wouldn't you be horrified? Wouldn't that be crazy? See, but the cool thing is, is it's what would be played is it would start and then it would go all squiggly and then it would be Jesus standing in for us. That's what he does as high priest. 
that imagery that we have there. That's what the frankincense represents. And so we're going to get to the myrrh. Myrrh is a fun word to say. Frankincense is a fun word to say too, but myrrh kind of sounds like you're mooing like a cow. Say it real. I don't do a good southern accent, but I could just figure somebody with a good big mouth of chewing tobacco and say myrrh. All right, so I know it's bad jokes. I have them. I'm a 47-year-old dad. That's it's in the job description. Bad jokes. They're there. Myrrh represents a lot of different things. On the practical side, it's this gum-like substance. And it also had medicinal uses, kind of like frankincense, but not as broad. It was used as an antiseptic, as a painkiller a little bit. Uh, In some of the translations, it talks about that vinegar was mixed with myrrh that they tried to give Jesus on the cross, and he didn't take that. Um, but, But myrrh, for the most part, was used for the very exciting work of embalming. Very, very exciting job to embalm people. So when somebody would die, they would use myrrh to embalm them. And that represents Jesus as our suffering servant. It showed us the pain and the suffering, the things that Jesus would endure For us. I was going to say because of us, but I think it's more for us. Yes, it is because of our sin. It is because of our brokenness, all the way back to Adam and Eve. But I don't think he looked at it and went, man, I've got to go down there and suffer because of you. I think he looked at it and said, I went down there and suffered because I love you. I want to do this for you. How many of us have ever... I think parenting, and I'm sorry if, you, if you've never had kids, you, you don't, might not get this, but maybe there's something in your life that you can relate it to. I would suffer a lot of things and sacrifice a lot of things for my children. That's the greatest way I can understand His love, and His love is beyond my love for my kids. Because even my love for my kids is imperfect. but I would do anything I could for him. Anything I could. And I think that's how Jesus viewed this. He went down for us. He became flesh for us. He came down so He could feel the same pain, go through the same anguish, understand all the emotions and feelings that we have so that He could understand us and more importantly, be the sacrifice for us pretty amazing, right? When you think about it, when you put it in that perspective, suffering servant. Now, are there any, uh, any football fans in here? Do you guys like football? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you. Um, I, I do have kind of a strange church that not everybody loves sports. You know, there's some, uh, some people that, that, that could take it or leave it. But Super Bowl will be in a couple months, or you got national championship coming up for college football. I like college football a little better than I do professional football. I just think that I think the plane's better. I think the intensity's a little bit better. But, you know, the, the Super, Bowl be, Super Bowl will be coming up in a couple months. What if I could predict who's going to win the Super Bowl 700 years from now? Point detail. That the Falcons and the Dallas Cowboys... No, I'm just kidding. Um... Oh, wow. What a pathetic year, right? Um, but if you could predict down to, it's going to be 24 to 7 and predict every detail of what was going to happen, wouldn't that be pretty amazing, right? Isaiah did that for Jesus. We're going to look at Isaiah 53 today. So if you want to jump over to Isaiah 53, we're going, to get, we're going to go there for just a minute. We're going to kind of chop it up a little bit, go out of order in a couple of the verses. But um, it's also on the printouts that you have there. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, but um, whatever translation you have is fine. Um, and if you ever want to have a discussion about translations, we can sometimes. Some are better than others. Some are not translations at all. Some are just paraphrases. So just understand that when you go in. Um, New Living's a good one. It just puts it in a little more plain of English, but it's a good translation. Um, But Isaiah 53, and I want to look at verse 6 for just a moment. It says, All of us, 
like sheep have gone have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of all of us. He's talking about Jesus. But what did it say? What did, what did he relate us to? Sheep. Do you think that's a compliment? Now they're cute and fuzzy like me. But uh, I mean, they're, they're, but sheep, they're not the smartest of the animals, are they? Back in 2005, maybe you've heard about this, in Turkey, in Turkey, 1,500 sheep walked off a cliff. 400 of them died, probably the first 400, and then it was just a nice pillow at the bottom after that. But 400 of the sheep died, but 1,500 walked off the cliff following each other. I think my wife's going to have a talk to me after this message. But 1,500 sheep walked off a cliff. Wouldn't you think after about five or six that somebody would say, hey guys, I think this is a bad idea. You know, how many of us have heard the parent phrase, you know, well, if your friend jumped off a cliff, would you follow him? Probably. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but it says, we like sheep have all gone astray. We've all walked away from the path that God has for us. And I'm not talking about this path that's like, oh, we have to, do, you know, if I didn't eat Fruit Loops this morning, then I've strayed from the path of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living a life for Christ living a life that honors God in, in all that we do and who we are. I think we make the will of God sometimes so restrictive that it's impossible for us to even move or breathe because we think we might step outside the will of God. The will of God is for us to have relationship with Him and to live for Him and to listen to Him. And yeah, there are times He's going to guide us in certain paths, but I don't think that, you know, if I didn't step, if I ate this food today and I should have ate that, that he's going to, you know, wipe me out or something. I say, Isaiah said we're like sheep. We've all sinned. We've all taken wrong steps. We've all misstepped with God. And sin, sin is something that our culture really doesn't talk about. I talked about that last week, that, that we don't understand holiness of God and righteousness very well because we don't understand sin anymore. We've kind of muddled sin. We've made it so it doesn't have the same effect that it once had because we've dumbed it down. You realize we've dumbed a lot of things down. But when we can take something and make it so it doesn't have the power that it really has, we don't understand what it is. And sin is anything that separates us from God. God is holy. Sin separates us from that. God can't exist with sin because sin is the opposite of Him. And really, sin at its core root is selfishness. It's putting our needs before anything else. It's like saying, forget you. I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want, and it doesn't matter who it affects or how it affects anybody else. That's the heart of sin. And when we sin before God, we're saying, okay, God, I know what you say is right, but I'm going to do this. That's really what sin is. And there's lists of different sins. You know, you've got sexual immorality, you've got um, murder and, and, and different things like that that we can look at and say, oh, those are sins. We can understand that. But all of us, like sheep, have wandered. In Romans says that all of us fall short of God's glorious standard. It's that same thing. I want to go and read a little bit more of Isaiah uh, 53. I'm going to back up just a little bit to verses 3-5, through because Isaiah said he would suffer great things because of our sin. Now look at this. He was despised and rejected. This is talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. He turned, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. 
And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Or in some versions it says, by his stripes we are healed. You've heard that probably before. This is speaking of Jesus. This is 700 years before He walked the earth. But don't we know through the Gospels that all of those things transpired? I want to read this again. I want this to sink in. I don't have a long message today. It's not a lot of things. But I want this to sink in. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on Him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. I want you to understand that when we kind of spit in the face of God and say, okay, God, I'm going to do what I want to do in spite of what I know is right, we just lived out that verse. I remember years ago, um, one of the first times I ever sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to me, and I've shared this story before, so if you've heard it before, just smile and nod like it's the most wonderful thing you've ever heard. But I, I was um, in Bible college down in, in Florida, and we used to go over in Orlando. There's a, a road called Orange Blossom Trail, and on parts of Orange Blossom Trail, it's kind of like the red light district. It's not a great place to go. Not all of Orange Blossom Trail is that way, but there is a section of it that is all strip clubs and prostitution and things like that. And they had set up a, uh, a mission there, and students, as part of our ministry internship hour type things, would go over, and we would go and witness to people on the streets of Orange Blossom Trail. Best place to send college students. I thought it was awesome. So I went over to Orange Blossom Trail, and, and we're, uh, we're talking to prostitutes. We're talking to all kinds of different people. Um, I remember my friend from uh, West Virginia. Um, I'm not going to say. He, he was just typical West Virginia. That's all I'm going to say. He, he went to the beach the first time and cut off shorts and a flannel shirt. It was great, but we're out there witnessing to somebody, and, and uh, he's just, he'd talk to anybody, and a, and a pimp tried to hit him in the head with a rock, and somebody came in and intervened. It was just crazy stuff, but I remember one day I walked up to a man that was laying on the ground, and we started talking to him, and he was obviously had been drinking quite a lot, and, and the man looked at me and said, look, I used to pastor a Baptist church and became an alcoholic. And God gave me words to say. Remember, I've talked about words of knowledge, and there's times when God gives us things to say that are beyond us. He told me to tell him. And this isn't about alcohol at all. This is just his story. He said, look, every time you drink that beer, you're nailing me to the cross. You're hammering the nails into my hands. And the man just broke down and cried. Now, that didn't mean anything to anybody else there. But it did to him because he once served God and found himself basically living on the streets as an alcoholic and destroyed ministry, family, and everything else. Sin separates us from God. So it's our sin that he carried. If you look at verse 4, yet in our weakness he carried. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighs him, weighed him down. And, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sin, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. He was the suffering servant. Jesus suffered greatly and went through great anguish because of us. Remember last year we spent a year going through the book of Mark. It was amazing, wasn't it? We went through the, the Gospels, and we're going to pick up a book study again this next year. We've kind of gotten away from it the last few months, but we're going to, we, went, we walked through the Gospels with the book of Mark as our roadmap. And if you remember, when we got to Easter, we talked about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, one version or one of the Gospels says that he was in such anguish that when he prayed, he sweat drops of blood. There's actually a scientific term for that, that he was in so much anguish that the vessels around his pores and his sweat glands actually burst and drips of sweat mixed with blood fell to the ground. 
such deep anguish that he looked at God and said, take this cup from me. I don't want to do this. This stinks. It's not my sin. That's that human side of Jesus at that moment. But then he took it a step further and said what? Not, your, not my will, but yours be done. Because he knew what needed to happen. But man, do you think he liked it? Do you think he was like jazzed up that he was going to be beaten? Thorns crushed on his head and carry the cross, all that stuff. I don't think he was. But he loved us enough that he did it for us. Yes, it was because of us, but he did it for us. He became our suffering servant, became our sacrifice. Think about the humiliation that he suffered. He basically hung on the cross naked. One of his own disciples betrayed him for a pit, for just a tiny bit of money, 30, 30 pieces of silver. Wasn't a lot. So when we say that Jesus understand, understood our emotions, understood our pain, understood those things, the sorrow, the grief, I think he had got it all. He died a criminal's death. Let's look down at verses 7 through 9, kind of wrap this part up a little bit, and then we'll go on to my final point, another 30, 40 minutes. No, I promise it won't take long. I'll wrap it up. I land the plane quick. He was oppressed and treated harshly, verse 7, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb to the slaughter. He was a sheep, or as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. And he was put in a rich man's grave. Didn't all those things come true? Think about that. 700 years. And we see the description of exactly what Jesus would go through. So that gift of myrrh, that gift of something that was really for embalming, really for burial, foreshadowed the suffering that he would endure because of us. This 18-month-old to two-year-old little boy probably didn't have any real use for myrrh at that moment. But it represented who he was. You have the gold. King of kings. The frankincense, our great high priest, and the myrrh, our suffering servant. All of those things wrapped together show us who he is. The king of the universe intercedes for us so that He gives us our righteousness and suffered greatly so that we could have a relationship with Him. Which brings me to my last point. And I promise my last point is much shorter than my, my first one. I saw that look back there. It's okay. Only a couple people falling asleep. For today, my gift to Jesus is my life. My gift to Jesus is my life. We know what God gave us, the presence, His presence. We know what the wise men gave, that prophetic look that, that showed who Jesus was going to be and who He is. What can I give? I can give myself. I can give all of who I am. That's what I want to challenge you today. To give all of who you are. Not just part of you. Not just words but truly who you are. I think when we treat our time with God flippantly, we mock what He's done for us. And I think it's most evident in what He suffered for us. Think about that for a minute. Now, I love you guys tremendously. Everybody in this room, I love you. But the Word of God hurts sometimes. It pokes us in places we don't like because it speaks truth into our lives. 
all of us. And I'm going to be honest, there are times that I have treated my relationship with God flippantly. And I think that's a sin. I think that separates me from Him. When I treat the things of God as something less than what they are, we've lost that sense of holiness, that sense of awe of God. Philippians chapter 3. If you want to jump over there, I'm going to wrap up with out of Philippians. This is Paul. Now, I'm going to skip down just a few verses in, ch- in chapter 3. I'm going to go down to ch- verse 5, but if you look at the first part of, verse, of Philippians 3, Paul has kind of defended himself. He's saying, look, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. And what that meant was, is I was somebody that before I came to Christ was all about obeying the law. It was all about my own righteousness. He was saying, I was the most righteous of Pharisees. You couldn't have done it any better than me. And then this is what Paul said. He goes, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. Just talking about his his righteousness. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Now look at this. It says, I once thought these things were valuable, and now I consider them, in some translations, rubbish or worthless or garbage because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with Himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that, no, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection of the dead. Now think about that for a moment. And that's a, that's a powerful passage right there. A powerful passage. Because Paul just said, I was so devout. I did everything right. And yet all of that was worthless compared to knowing Christ. So our gift to God would be for us to be so hungry and active to know Him. To follow after Him. Not to become a religious zealot, but to know Christ. Actually, His Word says they will know us by our love for one another. So actually, to know Christ is to be some of the most loving people you'll ever meet. Not the religious zealot. Because it's not about religion. It's not about doing everything right. It's about following God and knowing Him intimately. The only way we're going to do that is to spend time in His Word, to pray, to spend time around others that follow Him, to learn and to grow together. That's why we get together on Sunday mornings beforehand and do a small group and, and learn doctrine. That's why on Sunday nights we're going to do it. And the women get together you know, on Wednesday mornings and we try and to just grow closer to Him as we grow closer together. We can't rely on our own righteousness. We're not going to stand before God and have Him say, you know what, you're, the, you're, you're a great person. Actually, I think the hardest people to reach for God are really good people. People that really, on the surface, are great. Maybe they're, man, they, they help the poor. They're, they give you the shirt off their back. They're, you know, they live a good life. They don't go out and, you know, cross clubs and do all this crazy stuff. They're just really good people, but they miss that relationship with God. I think they're the hardest people to reach. But our righteousness won't do it. It's only the righteousness of Christ. That's why he's our high priest. That's why he came and sacrificed. That's why it's through our faith that we just learned in Philippians that we gain Christ's righteousness. So the last thing I want to read here, and then we'll close. 
It's one of my favorite passages from Paul. It's verse 12, just picking up. It says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. Paul, same guy that said, man, I was a perfect Pharisee, realized that even where he was in writing Scripture, suffering in jail, he wrote this from prison for Christ. He said, I I haven't reached perfection, but I press on towards that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. It's the goal. Look, we're all in the same race. And it's not a race to see who, which one of us gets there first. It's a race to get there and be in his presence. It's a race to win the prize of relationship with God and eternal life with Him. Forgetting the past. Man, we're almost to a new year. We could just wrap this into a new year's message and just call it a day. No matter what's happened, it's time for us to give God the one gift He desired the one reason that Jesus came and suffered all that stuff was to have you. That's it. You. He wants nothing else. He doesn't want you to come and feed families this afternoon. He wants you. Now, He does want you to do things. That's part of it. But if you come and serve this afternoon, it's not adding to your righteousness. It's just being obedient and sharing the love of Christ with families in need. There's a difference. It makes us feel good. We enjoy it. But it doesn't add to our righteousness. That comes through Christ and knowing Him. There's not some eternal scale out there that's weighing our good and our bad. Is only the righteousness of Christ. So as we close today in prayer, I want us to, if God's speaking to you today, if the Holy Spirit's just speaking to your heart, to make a commitment to Him to strive that much deeper in relationship with Him this Christmas, throughout this next year. All year from Easter to now has been building to this point. Recognizing the presence of God and what He's done in our lives. Recognizing all of who He is and all that He does and all that He wants us to be. He wants us to be His children. To love Him. To grow like Him. To become like Him. Not to become God's, but to take on His character. So we're just going to take a few minutes and pray as Pastor Jennifer plays. And then we're, we'll, uh, the way we do offering here for, for our guest is the baskets are on the table. You got the connection cards, which were mentioned earlier. I'm going to pray over the offering in a little bit. And then we're going to close the service today. And I didn't mention this to Jennifer, but I'd like to close the service with that last song we sang for worship today. You probably need the sheet, don't you? That's what I get for not for preparing that. It didn't hit me until I got up here. But we'll, we'll swing it. My, my beautiful daughter will help you out. But can we just for a few minutes spend some time in prayer? And, and we believe in, in laying hands on each other and praying for one another. If you have something that you want to pray about, feel free to come up and, and pray or go to somebody that you trust in the room and just say, hey, can you pray with me? Our relationship with God is a very intimate and personal thing. But the cool thing is, is He's given us each other as a family to walk that journey together. So there's no shame in saying, hey, can you pray with me? Can you walk with me on this? Matter of fact, I couldn't make it without people in my life, without my wife telling me, man, you need to stop doing that. 
She does a good job of it. I'm going to hear it this afternoon with my jokes. Let's just pray.